So good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Tony Berrien. I'm the president of the um, Hearing Loss Association of America, Mission Viejo chapter. Um, and we are part of Hearing Loss Association of America, uh, home office or the headquarters located in Maryland, in Rockville, Maryland. So welcome you all today. Um, I am going to share my screen for a couple of announcements. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go into a Zoom lesson, but I am going to show you a couple of things that you're going to need to know to get through this program. First of all, we are being recorded um, and I will be posting the recording on the chapter YouTube channel. And that, uh, and I will send out an email when it's ready. Uh, if you are signed up for, uh, to be a member of the YouTube channel, you should get a notice in your email when, um, when it's available. Okay. First off, uh, captions are available. Look for the CC button in your toolbar at the bottom of the screen and you want to click on it and you want to click on show subtitle show subtitle at any time if you want to look at the entire transcript you can click on view transcript and you can even save it to your computer if you would like the third setting is subtitle settings where you can adjust the size of the font Anybody have any questions? Are you finding it? Um, Alan uh, is here and Alan Katsura is technical support. And you can use the chat function for technical support. So I better show you the chat uh, icon. Click on that and type your message where it says type message here. So if you want to send, a, you want to test that right now, just click on chat and say, hi, my name is, and send us a message. So it's a little practice. Okay. When a message shows up, you will see a, a little number located on the, on the chat icon. And by the way, if anything gets in the way of the captions, you can move the captions, grab it with your mouse and move it to the left, to the right, up, down, wherever you need to put it so you can see what you're not seeing. Okay. The room, uh, we, have, we have over 70 people signed up for this. Um, program and it will be impossible to see you if you're waving. You only see 24 people on a screen. So the way we're going to handle that is we're going to ask you to use the raise hand function when you have a question. So down in the, the uh, toolbar is where there is reactions. You want to click on there and then you just want to click on raise hand. Immediately, your name will show your name and your picture will show up uh, visible front and center and I and I, I will take people in order of their questions. So um, Juliet, are you are you applauding or are you raising your hand? You must be applauding. So if it's on the side, that's an applause. Straight up is a hand. Okay, so if you want to practice that, go ahead. Okay, Mustafa, you did that. Wonderful, thank you. And you can also go back and lower your hand. And if you don't do that, and I've answered your, your question's been answered, I will lower it for you. So, okay. Uh, our sponsor. Our sponsor is Caption Call, and we thank Caption Call for supporting this chapter and actually supports um, the captioning 
Uh, Joe Gale is here. She's located in the state of Illinois. I'm not sure exactly if it's Chicago, but she is our captioner today and she's really great and we appreciate her being here and we appreciate Caption Call. So Caption Call provides captions wherever you need it, on your landline phone, on your iPhone, or on your iPad, which is great if you travel because if you're in Wi-Fi, you can use your iPad to make phone calls from you know, any place. So um, it's a great service. If you want more information, it's their telephone number is 877-557-2227. Or you can email them caption, uh, customer support or support at captioncall.com. Support at captioncall.com. And Alan, could I ask you to put that in the chat box? The telephone number and the um, email address. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the Mission Viejo chapter is a 501c3 tax exempt chapter. Any donations you make are tax deductible. Uh, work it out with your, your tax. Uh, I don't know what your tax. Uh, uh, situation is, but uh, many, uh, many are deductible. So talk to your uh, tax person and see if your deductions can be um, exempt or you change your tax status. We are all volunteer organizations. There's uh, 10 or 12 staff members. Everybody else, every chapter is a volunteer and we always need volunteers. So volunteers for the Mission Viejo chapter, we have uh, Judy is here serving uh, Mandel and she's with us and she is our secretary. Uh, Jeff Chess is our treasurer, I'm the president. Um, George Gross is our program director. We have an opening for vice president. And that, that is a really important position that backs me up. So I would love to hear from you if you would like to get involved and help make a difference to people with hearing loss. So uh, donate online. Um, local membership is not required, but we do depend on your donations for support. And our website is www.hlaamv.org. Okay, really important this weekend, um, as a matter of fact, Saturday is our walk for hearing day, but we're not walking like outside. We're doing it virtually, so you can walk around your computer room. Uh, it is a very fun and exciting event. Um, you will meet people from all over California, um, and everybody that would like to will speak up why they're there, why they uh, like the Walk for Hearing, and how much fun it is. They, they may even talk to you about all those times that we had them, um, uh, let's just see here, that we had them in person. So I need to move my notes over here. Um, it's the only nationwide event that brings attention to hearing loss and promotes the importance of hearing health. And the funds that are raised um, at the walk uh, support the national awareness and education programs. And chapters and states who participate actually share in the fundraising. So what that means is that donations that are made um, for the Mission Viejo team um, we get we get 40% of that, and that is really helpful for uh, paying our expenses. And we do have, believe it or not, quite a bit of expenses. And we're looking to getting back into some in-person meetings, and that's going to create additional expense. Okay. I wanted to show you, let's see. That's the walk for hearing there. Nope. Da, 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 da. Wanted to show you. I don't know. Is 
Is my screen changing for you? Okay, so this is my walk for hearing page. And um, I am going to send you a link in the chat. And if you can pick this up in the chat, you can actually save the chat and um, it will be downloaded on your computer at the end of the meeting. So here we go. So this is this is the, the donation page that is assigned to Mission Viejo chapter. If you would like to participate in the, uh, the Walk for Hearing event, they want you to, uh, okay, where'd it go? They want you to RSVP. So, let me give you an RSVP. The reason for the RSVP is so that you can get you can get the um, the link to the event. Okay, excuse me. I need to. Okay, <laughs> Alan, would you do me a favor? <clears throat> Would you explain to everybody how they can save chat? Sure. If you have your chat window open, in the lower right corner, there are three dots in a little box. If you click on that, it opens up a menu. And at the very top, it says Save Chat. By default, it will save in Windows anyways. It will save the chat in the document folder and in a subfolder called Zoom. Excellent. Thank you. OK. So um, go, going back to that. Go back to the slide. Where is the slide? Okay. All right. So that's the walk for hearing. Now, that's this Saturday. So that needs your attention right away. Um, I do want to tell you about the virtual convention. Uh, it's in June, June 24 and 26. Um Normally they're in person. This is will be the second virtual and they've made some really wonderful uh, new things they're going to be doing. Um, what I want to tell you about that is uh, the registration is, oops. Oh, okay. First of all, there's a symposium. The symposium is on Saturday, noon to 1.30. So, it's a research in, in, uh, in, um, symp <laughs> symposium. Oh, I'm getting tongue tied. And, uh, and it's Hearing Care for All Innovations in Extending the Reach of Hearing Care. So um, there are experts that are participating in that um, audiologists, and medical doctors, and they're generally from the National Institutes for Health. Um, there's going to be workshops throughout the, the two days. Uh, topics include wireless accessibility um, and your devices, what you need to know about hearing aids, the workplace and the latest di digital inclusion technology. So technology that you uh, is available to you to use on the job. Um, communication access and healthcare. I imagine that has to do with telehealth Telehealth by itself is great, but not without captions. So let's uh, let's learn what's going on with telehealth and uh, communication access. And also, there's the next generation of Bluetooth connectivity that's coming out. Registration is um, up to the fifteenth. 
and um, it's $35 for two days of, okay, so, okay. Um, I can't, I'm, I'm trying to read the, the chat messages and write to you. So here's the information um, for the uh, virtual convention. The first line is, uh, the first website is a general. It shows you um, exactly the whole schedule, when it is, when each workshop is. And also, after you, um, yeah, here's the registration, through the 15th, so that's next Sunday, I believe. And when you register, you'll get a confirmation that you registered. And then on the week of June the 21st, you'll get a link that will that will take you directly into the convention and, and help you get to where you want to go. And also the um, the convention uh, link here will show the schedule. They're even going to have a welcome where they're going to have live entertainment, just as if you were there. <laughs> and introduction and how to get the most out of the convention. So it's really going to be a very exciting time. Okay, this is my information. Um, uh, you can reach me at uh, Tony at HLAAMV.org uh, if you have any questions. Maybe you can, uh, so this is today. So uh, please, uh, Alan, if you could put in my email address, that would be great. So today's meeting, um, I think we're ready. Oh, two things. We are dark July and August. We take a summer break. We take a summer break. And um, we do have, I do want you to know that we have speakers for soon as I can. Uh, we have Ashley Bella Kerr, MD, and she's going to be talking about, if I can just pull up my, I don't know where it is. She's, she is a cochlear implant uh, surgeon. She's going to be talking about cochlear implants for uh, all ages, but she's going to be talking specifically um, addressing adults. So if you're in that adult category, um, she will be, okay, she'll be addressing uh, adult cochlear implant surgery. I can't get, I can't get my, <laughs> I can't get my document up. Okay. Um, Michelle, uh, that's, that's Ashley uh, Bal Balaker is no, uh, September 14th. October the 12th, we have Michelle Kapalowitz. She is a PhD research uh, hearing loss research she has uh, at UCI Medical Center, and she has, um, okay, she, <laughs> where'd that come from? She has uh, spoken with us before. As a matter of fact, the very first meeting I had that we had over 100 people, that was Michelle. Uh, she hasn't told us what her topic is, but she is going to be talking about research and I'll be providing that information on our website. And, um, okay, I'm going to stop sharing. I, now uh, we want to move on and, and introduce um, Juliet, Juliet Sturkins, Dr. Juliet Sturkins from Wisconsin. 
and she is a hearing loop advocate for the Hearing Loss Association of America. And she's just recently come back from the Netherlands and um, where she is from and where her, she was visiting with her mother. And um, so she travels all over the United States promoting hearing loops. But today she's gonna be talking to us about telecoils. And before you can um, use a hearing loop or many assistive devices, you first need to have a telecoil. So welcome, Juliet. Please, there you go. Take take the screen. Take take the mic. <laughs> and there. You okay, I turned the sound on. Can everybody hear me? Or and most importantly, Joe, can you hear me? She's our captionist um, today. And. Um, if I could just make a quick plug for the Walk for Hearing, I find that it is the easiest way to get your family and friends to support what you do and what you believe in. And every year it surprises me when I put my Walk for Hearing up on the web or on Facebook, I mean, the donations come out of the woodwork. It's 10 bucks here, it's 25 bucks there, and pretty soon we're talking real money. So um, please, if you are um, not, if you belong to the chapter, but you haven't started your Walk for Hearing donation, please do so. Um, so if I could just get my mouse to work, we'd be in business. Here we go. Um, so, I, I mean, they asked me to talk for 30 minutes and everybody who knows me knows that that's a really tall order, but I'm going to throw a lot of information at you. Um, this is being recorded, so if you uh, think I'm going too fast, uh, you can review the slides later. You're welcome to email me. I mail slides to people. I also counsel people individually. There's no charge. What you do is you contact me via email and I kind of jump into gear to try and help you. And I do that for people around the country. So my background information, I'm going to skip over that. I've been an audiologist for almost um, 40 years. So let's just start with why you need more than just hearing aids. You know, what's hearing loss all about? And I'm, I can do that in just a quick couple of slides. So for most people, most people think that hearing loss is just a matter of loudness. Turn up the volume, speak a little louder, and then everything will be hunky-dory. Now, if your hearing loss is the kind of hearing loss that only needs sound to be louder, then making sound louder will make it easier for you to hear. But the truth is, that for over 95% of people with hearing loss, they have trouble understanding. They have a clarity issue. They have trouble discriminating sounds. So that if I make that little image that you see on your screen bigger, yeah, sure, I can make it bigger. But the big question is, does it get any clearer? You have to make it bigger in order to be able to see it, but at a certain point, blowing it up won't help you um, see the image any better. In fact, it makes it worse. Same applies to hearing loss. So why is it that people with hearing aids and cochlear implants complain that they can hear, but they can't understand? Number one reason is that hearing aids do not correct hearing loss the way my eyeglasses correct my vision issues. Hearing aids correct for about half of the degree of hearing loss. So if you have a 50 decibel hearing loss, eh, I can probably make you hear at a level of about 25. That's almost normal range. But if you have an 80 decibel hearing loss or a 90 decibel hearing loss, you can quickly see and do the math that 
even the best, best of hearing, hearing. Aid are not um, going to give you normal hearing. The next reason why people complain that they hear but can't understand is that the hearing aids, while they can make sound louder, cannot change the way you process sound. So for me, being Dutch, if I'm listening to somebody with a heavy accent, forget it. It takes so much processing power in my brain that after a while, I shut them off. This is the big reason why everybody should get what is called a speech in noise test. It's called a sin test, has nothing to do with sinning, has everything to do with your ability to understand speech and noise. Without that test, no audiologist can say for certain how well you're going to do in background of noise with hearing aids. And the truth is a lot of people cannot hear well in background of noise. Third reason why hearing aid users complain, they bought hearing aids, they have cochlear implants that say that they have noise reduction built in. Well, yeah, sure. Noise reduction works the best for steady state noise. So you vacuum the house, you turn on your vacuum cleaner, some of the noise goes down and your hearing aids help you hear speech better. But most people don't care about vacuum cleaning noise. They wanna be able to hear in background of babble noise. Hearing aids have a really hard time zooming through that kind of noise. And on top of that, the microphones of hearing aids have trouble hearing over distance. So realistically, the effective range of hearing aids and cochlear implants is six feet. Six feet. That doesn't mean you can't hear what's going on in the kitchen. Yes, you can hear that someone's talking in the kitchen but you cannot understand what they're saying. Now, some people can, but the majority of people can't. And that's the reason why people with hearing aids and cochlear implants really struggle in a lot of situations. Now, I'm gonna get really basic because everybody wants a magic cure. Give me the pill, give me the best hearing aid or the best cochlear implant, and now everything will be hunky-dory. And for those of you who've heard me speak before, and for those of you who've attended a lot of these lectures, you have learned that there is no magic hearing aid. Once the hearing aid is appropriately fit and verified, that's the best it's going to be. And if you have trouble hearing a certain friend or a granddaughter, um, there are things that you can do and you're gonna go, duh, these are really simple suggestions. In private, we're gonna talk about private and public situations. In private, the simplest way for you to hear and understand better is to ask that particular person to either speak louder or clearer. It's something called clear speech. And I have a handout on that. If you want the handout, email me. Because when people speak a little slower, sometimes rephrase or face you, they, they give your brain more ability to fill in the gaps that your ears have trouble picking up. Number two, move closer. There is no way that even with the best of hearing aids, you'll be able to hear around the corner, understand around the corner. So louder and moving physically closer are the two simplest suggestions. And yes, that means that a lot of stuff comes down on the shoulders of your partners. Or last suggestion, use a wireless remote microphone. That would be a whole other issue uh, and a lecture but I'm just bringing it up that in this list of how to overcome hearing aid limitations, louder, 
moving closer or using a remote control, nowhere does it say buy a better hearing aid. Because the truth is that a better hearing aid isn't going to help you understand better. So that's for private. That would be a whole lecture right there. Now we're talking public situations, church, library, meeting rooms, going to a play and a theater, um, going to a graduation in, a, in an auditorium. In those places, that's where the law is your friend. Under the Americans with Disabilities Act law, you have a right to what is called a reasonable accommodation. And that's defined for people with hearing loss as an assistive listening system. Bear with me, I'll get to the telecoils in a moment, all right? So to benefit from an assistive listening system, users need a telecoil, all right? And why do they need a telecoil? Well, the law specifies that a church or a, or a theater or a library meeting room shall either provide an FM system an infrared system or a hearing loop system. Now, an FM system or an infrared system requires you, the user, before you sit down in the theater, to go to the front desk, pick up a listening device, take that device with you to your seat and turn it on. But in order to get the sound from that device in your hearing aids, users need a telecoil. The telecoil in the hearing aid will pick up the magnetic signal that this neck loop on the right side of the screen around the neck of the user creates. There's a magnetic signal that it creates. Your question should be, well, why can't I just use headphones? The truth is headphones cannot be strong enough for some users, and they are not going to work for people who wear cochlear implants. The law requires that theaters that have assistive listening systems offer neck loops on 25% of their listening devices. So if you want to go see Hamilton, if and when we ever get back into the theater, you go to the front desk and you say, I want a listening device with a neck loop. In order to benefit from that neck loop, you need a T-coil in your hearing aid. By the way, it used to be that um, theaters offered these kinds of devices. Well, they don't work for hearing aid users or for cochlear implant users. So then the company started offering neck loops. These neck loops have been around for many, many years. They're not preferred, but they will work, okay? The other assistive listening system that's required under the law as one of the three systems is the hearing loop system. And the hearing loop allows a user to literally walk into a venue sit down in their chair, don't have to pick up anything. When the performance start, when the lecture starts, they click on the telecoil in their hearing aid so that they can hear. And the nifty part is those loops work in the Netherlands, in Australia, and in any place that has a loop installed because they must meet a certain standard. So that telecoil, is not just used for hearing in an assistive with an assistive listening device. So telecoils are useful for hearing in looped venues, places that offer infrared or FM boxes with neck loops, but they also work in your TV room. If you don't have a TV streamer or a TV transmitter in your room that comes with your hearing aids or implants, I suggest that you look into installing a loop in your TV room. If you rely just on captions, you're missing out on a lot of information that a loop can provide. Now, telecoils also work on almost all landline telephones 
and on cell phones with a very high T rating. And here's the big advantage. When you pick up your phone and you turn your telecoil on, you turn off all the background noise around you so that you can hear the signal from the phone transmitted wirelessly into your hearing aid. Now, I know that some hearing aids have that feature uh, built in via Bluetooth, but there's still a lot of people who don't use Bluetooth effectively. And then last but not least, if you struggle on your computer to hear or on your iPad to hear, consider getting a neck loop because the sound from your iPad or your computer will go wirelessly in your hearing aids. You can sit right in front of your computer. I mean, I can certainly recommend people who could do some really good lectures on that topic. Um, and this is what a neck loop looks like. And, and just one word of advice, having a neck loop this tight around your neck is not a good idea. You should drape that neck loop kind of wide around your neck to get a good signal. How do you know? If an assistive listening system is offered in the venue where you visit, generally they display the ear sign with the slash through it, okay? But you're going to notice that the symbols on the left side of the screen all have that letter T. That stands for telecoil. These systems all refer to hearing loops that your telecoil in your hearing aid can pick up. On the right side of the screen are logos where you need to go to the front desk and pick up a listening device. And I know it's a hassle, but if you do, you'll be rewarded with much better sound while you're watching a play or while you're attending a lecture in the library. So in a loop, here's what's happening. The sound from this microphone is broadcast to an amplifier. That amplifier creates a current that runs through this loop and the telecoil in the hearing aid picks up the sound wirelessly because the loop is creating a magnetic field. So if you are the kind of person who hears much better when people are very close, think of being in a loop as if you're this close to the mouth of the presenter. You're going to be hearing clear, pure sound that's being picked up by the microphone um, of the presenter or um, in the theater of microphones on the stage. Now, like Tony mentioned, to benefit from hearing loops and other public assistive technology, you need a T-coil. They're in about 70% of all hearing aids, almost all cochlear implants. All manufacturers offer them. They now even come in over the counter devices. They're cheap, usually they're standard. They don't cost anything extra. They're built in um, and they're almost always standard on powerful hearing aids. Don't let anybody tell you that you have to choose between getting a hearing aid that has a Bluetooth option or a T-coil or a rechargeable option or a T-coil. That's not true anymore. It may have been true a couple of years ago. That's no longer the case. And you'll want a T-coil if you need to use regular landlines, lines, cell phones, and other assistive devices because when you switch your hearing aid to telecoil, it turns off all the background noise, right? And the good news is that the hearing aid manufacturers are adding telecoils to their devices. That even includes Costco's latest hearing aid, the Kirkland 10.0. It has a standard telecoil. And the fact that Costco is doing this um, I think is a wonderful sign. Other manufacturers are following suit. So telecoils, I want to tell you that they're not a gimmick, that they work because there's direct transference from sound from a microphone somewhere on a stage or on a lectern direct into your hearing aid. 
If you ever see people do this with their cell phone while they're in the car because they need to hear better, they are doing what a loop does for people who wear hearing aids. They're user preferred and where they are installed, where loops are installed, telecoils are increasingly used. But, and here's the but, users need to be told about them. So how do you know if your hearing aid has a T-coil? I'm finding that a lot of people have one, but they were never told about telecoils. Their audiologist kind of dismissed telecoils. They didn't think that it was important that their client would go to their wedding of a granddaughter where there is a loop in the church and that this person may want to hear. Providers put a lot of faith in the devices that they put on your ears. And part of that is a lot of marketing by the hearing aid industry. The hearing aid and the cochlear implant industry want you to believe that if you have trouble hearing, that you need to upgrade your hearing aid, that you need to upgrade your cochlear implant because then you'll be able to hear everything. Well, an upgrade will certainly make a difference but it's still not going to give you normal hearing. So how do you know if your hearing aid has a T-coil or your um, cochlear implant? If your hearing aid has a push button, there is a really good chance that your hearing aid has a T-coil. And if you use an app for your device, either for your implant or for your hearing aids, almost always will there be a program that will say telecoil, except on the little image that I have on the screen here. <clears throat> Bad choice of image. It doesn't have one. I plucked that one from the web. Now, some consumers are being told that telecoils are old technology and that all they need is Bluetooth. And the good news is, and you already heard from Tony that this topic is going to be discussed, um, at the HLAA convention that there is some form of new Bluetooth on the horizon. It's called Bluetooth LE audio, low energy audio. But I'm going to let you in on a secret. That type of technology at first will only work and work well with when you buy a new TV, the chip will be, will be built in. So you link to your TV and it'll broadcast right to your hearing aids. You buy a new cell phone, your cell phone will quickly link to your hearing aids. Your audiologist recommends a remote microphone. That microphone links very quickly to your hearing aids and will not drain the battery very much. But to expect that the world where we now have millions of FM and infrared systems installed will overnight quickly switch to public Bluetooth LE audio systems is not going to happen. And the truth is that there is still quite an audio delay with Bluetooth technology. And that means that you'll, you'll see on the stage something happening, but the sound that you get in your hearing aids will be delayed. There will be an echo. That problem hasn't been solved. And frankly, uh, we've been talking about jetpacks. We've been talking about self-driving cars for the last decade, but I think I'm gonna die before we will see self-driving cars in Amsterdam, okay? Because you ask me, they're gonna end up in the canals. So the bad news is that this new technology is not going to happen overnight. And that means that really what consumers need is both. That the whole transition to this new technology is estimated to take 10 to 15 years. Personally, I take a far more pessimistic look on this. I think it could be 25 years or longer. So in the meantime, you need to consider that we have over three or four million hearing loops installed worldwide. 
They're being installed in airports, in theaters, in library meeting rooms. There have been thousands of installed loops in the United States since the 2000s, right? In Wisconsin, when I first started, there were half a dozen loops. Today, we're over 800 with 500 churches. And it's not just about places that have installed hearing loops. It's, in, it's about places that also offer FM systems with neck loops. Um, and those systems are going to be around for a decade, if not longer. So what's a consumer to do? You need to get hearing aids that have both Bluetooth and telecoils. Don't take no for an answer. Tell your audiologist you want both. OK, and you need to learn about the telecoils, how to turn them on, how to turn them off, ask for information in writing. And you need to, in the, if your audiologist is hesitant, because I've encountered that, audiologists, some audiologists are not very familiar with telecoil and telecoil programming. Encourage them to call the audiology department at the hearing aid company or encourage them to contact me. I am happy to educate them. This is what I do on a regular basis. OK, you need to be familiar how to activate your telecoil. Almost always it's a push of a button, but then you need to listen as to how many beeps you hear to know if you're in the correct program. I personally believe audiologists ought to have loops in their offices so that you can go into the waiting room and try it out and experience it. And for those of you who are experienced with telecoils and hearing loops, please do me one favor. Next time you see your provider, tell him or her what hearing loops and telecoils mean to you. They need to hear from you that you love having a telecoil, that it's beneficial to you in a certain situation, okay? Um, there's all kinds of handouts. I am not going to go um, through these, but if you um, would like to read more, um, I'm happy to provide links to videos or to handouts um, that you give you the chance to kind of read things over. I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you. Um, also, HLAA has developed a terrific toolkit with materials that help you become a better advocate. Um, and this is where I do my little plug to your chapter that you may not have been very active in loop advocacy um, or it's kind of died down a little bit. If you want to start up a hearing loop committee, I'm happy to help you and make this happen at your chapter. OK, um, my experience is where people speak up, where they have trouble hearing and say, why don't you install a hearing loop? My church has one and it makes all the difference that this will happen. That's how it's been happening in Wisconsin. So the toolkit has all kinds of materials. I draw attention to this card that says for audiologists and hearing, hearing aid providers. This is a handout that you can take to your audiologist to have your telecoil programmed. Because if you're hearing, if you're very hard of hearing, because that's why you're attending, and when you switch your hearing aid to telecoil and you don't hear anything around you, it can be kind of lonesome. You can be sitting in, in the library meeting room and you hear the speaker perfectly, but you can't hear people to your left and right. There's a solution for that. Your audiologist will want to know that maybe you need to have your hearing aid programmed so that you have the microphone active while the T-coil is engaged. So you can have a T-coil only program or you can have an M plus T program. And if you have an app on your phone, a lot of apps allow you to um, change the mixing ratio. I know I'm getting very techy here. If you're interested, contact me 
and I'll be happy um, to help you and explain things further. One more handout um, that if you're going to see your audiologist, you could do me a huge favor if you were to give this handout, print it off on your computer, please just use black and white, okay? Because the orange will deplete all the orange on your printer. Um, but this handout explains how audiologists in Indiana has to have fostered hundreds of hearing loops. Um, it's a success story in the Midwest and other audiologists need to hear um, how easily this can be done. And then last but not least, I have a handout on how to advocate for hearing loops. Everybody can do a little bit, it doesn't be very big. So I have this list of 12 things that you can do. And Tony, I can email it to you so that um, you can share it with your members or you can post it on your website. Um, there's just a, a wealth of information out there. And if you say, but I want a hearing loop at my local planetarium, contact me because I have um, support for you. Um, that kind of uh, concludes what I have prepared. Um, this is my email, jsturkins at hearingloss.org. Um, email me if you have questions, I'm happy to help you. So what I'm going to do is stop sharing so that I can see people. Um, I hate just kind of talking into a vacuum. Um, and oh. Rick, I'm going to have you take it away unless you want me to answer questions first, um, Tony. Well, let's go ahead and have Rick talk because uh, and then we'll open Q&A for everybody and I just wanted to say uh, thank you to uh, Sherry who has put some links in the chat of some of the uh, regarding the hearing loop toolkit and the postcard I, I have I have a lot of that information as well so I'm another source that you can contact for some of the flyers and uh, information that Juliet is talking about. So, um, so let me just say about Rick. So Rick is, um, is a designer and an installer for hearing loops in Southern California. And um, he's done some pretty amazing uh, hearing loops. Um, you know, he like went to the Pasadena Playhouse, so uh, which has been looped. And um, if you have questions about your favorite places and, and if they're looped or not, you certainly can ask him. Um, so Rick, I'm now gonna pass the mic to you. So welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you, Tony. I appreciate that. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, and thank you, Juliet. Uh, that was amazing. Uh, you made my presentation a lot easier. Uh, some of the things um, Juliet shared with you, I'll probably be repeating, but that's okay. It doesn't matter to hear things twice. It kind of sinks in better. So anyway, I'm going to start out. Uh, my presentation is about hearing loops. Um, I'll give you a little history to start out with. First of all, um, hearing loops are actually called induction loops. So depending on how sophisticated you are. So a hearing loop or the induction loop was actually uh, first manufactured or discovered in about 1937 in England of all places. Um, and it wasn't a hearing loop that they produced. It was a telecoil and a system for the telephone and uh, that was actually the first connection for the telecoil was through the telephone so that was the introduction of uh, the induction loop uh, to begin with so from 19 the the late 1930s until oh probably the 50s it kind of just mm, meandered along there wasn't a lot of, uh, of uh, 
interest in it other than through the telephone. Uh, some people played around with uh, actually looping. Um, and the reason it was so uh, slow to develop is because of technology, the amplification of, um, and, and amplifiers. And uh, a lot of the early loop systems were actually just plain amplifiers that were kind of tweaked in order to produce the electromagnetic signals that go along with the hearing loop. And as a matter of fact, some of the early ones, uh, radio shack amplifiers, some of the people just actually modified the radio shack amplifiers and made them into hearing loops. Uh, they weren't very good, uh, but they did the job. I mean, you could hear better with them. Uh, it wasn't perfect, but as Juliet stated, you know, hearing aids have their limitations. So anything that goes beyond hearing from a hearing aid is, is uh, gold. So anyway, from after the, after the 50s, uh, the 60s through say the 80s, um, things started improving as technology improved. And so they developed some companies that actually produced what we call in the business drivers, which is actually a sophisticated amplifier uh, with a lot of bells and whistles. So some of the predominant com companies in the world are um, like Univox, uh, Contacta, which is in Britain, uh, Amp Amphonic, and um, in the United States, there was, there's a popular one called Oval Window, who manufactures in the US. So all of these companies have been working to develop a better, what we call again, driver or amplifier for the hearing loop. Um, in, let's see, about 1990, um, there was something that really helped us and Juliet referred to it. It's the American Disability Act. And that gave people with hearing loss a real uh, step up as far as abilities to have a voice in the disability of hearing loss. So the, the American Disability Act said, you know, the people with hearing loss have to have access uh, for their hearing loss. And uh, we kind of uh, took that and ran with it and developed better and better systems. Uh, Juliet and Matt uh, already told you there's the, the uh, I, IR system, the, the uh, FM system, and uh, of course the hearing loop system. Uh, of all three systems, uh, the most popular one uh, as far as hearing loss is concerned or hearing, people with hearing loss is of course um, the hearing loop. And, and, and why is that? Um, it's just because it's easier. You know, you can walk in, turn your hearing aid on and, and hear. And Juliet explained to you, you know, the dysfunctions of the amplification from the FM system and the RIR system. And I'm not going to dwell on that because uh, we're gonna try to keep this simple. Um, and let's say, uh, continuing on, let's say uh, the, about the year 2000, uh, there's a guy, uh, and this is really a popular story, so it's not hard to find if you Google it. Uh, Dr. David Myers uh, was traveling abroad. Uh, he's a man with uh, hearing loss, and he discovered in, I think it was an old church that he was in, that if he turned his telecoil on, because he saw, I think he saw the sign, who knows, Anyway, um, he turned his telecoil on and lo and behold, he could hear everything that was going on in that old church. So what does he do? He comes back to the United States and he says, you know, we need something like that here. I suspect that's what went through his mind. And he was actually one of the forerunners 
promoting hearing loops in the United States. Uh, so along with him, uh, the, uh, the pr production and the uh, popularity of hearing loops kind of expanded. So between 2000 and 2010, there was a lot of things that happened that gave a real bump to the hearing loop. Uh, 2007, the IEC, the International um, Electronic, uh, whatever it is, uh, they, anyway, they developed a, a uh, standard for hearing loops so that when supposedly you install a hearing loop, I would, shouldn't say a supposedly, when you install a hearing loop, it should meet a standard. Uh, an international standard so that no matter what room you walk into, in, 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 even in what country you walk into, that hearing loop should produce the same sound anywhere. And that, that's kind of a cool thing because before that, it was just a matter of of what you thought was best for whoever you installed the loop for. And, and some of the loops were barely uh, functional, whereas the ones with the standard, they meet, they meet the uh, requirements and you can actually hear pretty well in, in a uh, uh, IEC standard room. Uh, also 2010, uh, Amer uh, HLAA and uh, the American Academy of Audiology kind of joined forces and they promoted get in the hearing loop. So that kind of gave a big impetus to, to um, people believing in the loop. Okay, so that kind of gives you a background of the, of the hearing loop uh, and where it came from and, where, and kind of how it's moved along. So currently, um, uh, a, a quick description of the loop uh, and Juliet showed you a picture of the room with, if you remember, there was a room with a uh, wire going around it and an amplifier and a guy talking. Well, that's a basic hearing loop. It's a physical wire that goes around the room, attaches to what we call in the business a driver, which is a glorified amplifier with all the bells and whistles. And when you have amplified sound put into that amplifier, it produces an electromagnetic field that encompasses the room that you're inside of, all right? It's like an umbrella inside the room. And if the loop has been installed properly, no matter where you sit in that room, you will hear a perfect audio presentation as though that guy was talking right in your ear or that person. Uh, and that's the beauty of the loop. Um, I'm not going to get into the different types of loops we can do. There's different configurations that we do in different size venues, but just the basic is wherever you are, you have to be surrounded by wire to produce this umbrella of electromagnetic signals. And that signal, of course, attach, uh, 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 transmits to the telecoil in your hearing aid. That's the whole idea of this thing. So uh, let's see, we did that and that and that, broadcast sound. Oh, one of the cool things uh, about the um, sound that is broadcast is, it does go into your hearing aid, but, but what people forget to mention is, is that sound that goes into your hearing aid is adjusted to your hearing loss. So where if you were to go into a room with FM and you put the headphones on, you'll hear sound and you'll hear what they're saying, but it's not adjusted to your hearing loss if you don't put it over your hearing aids. Uh, and a lot of people take their hearing aids out when they use the FM uh, because it's sometimes uncomfortable. So um, also along with uh, the uh, hearing loop that is installed, 
Uh, I provide actually a portable one. I do a lot of conventions. I do a lot of conventions. I don't know what that is. Anyway, I do a lot of conventions and um, uh, presentations where I put a temporary loop in. I run a wire around the room, tape it down. Uh, if it's carpet where people walk, I tape that down. I run it to a, a portable driver that I carry with me. And then I plug in the sound system to it and voila, they've got a loop in the room. Uh, sometimes it's not as simple as that, but it, it, whatever venue it is, I can make it work. And I have done that. And it's, it's kind of a, a really good way to present the loop to people uh, that don't know what it is uh, and let them experience it. Uh, when I do that, I provide uh, what we call a listener. Um, where did that go? Anyway, there it is. Anyway, the listener is something that I put on the tables along with uh, a headphone or earbud, whatever I have with me. And so I put several of them on each table in the venue and people that aren't familiar or don't have a T-coil, they can use this listener, hang it around their neck, plug it in and listen to the venue. And it's a good way for them to experience uh, what the hearing loop is and get them all excited about it. So uh, Julia, uh, went over the neck loops, which are important, but I've been doing this for mm, 15 years now. <laughs> uh, and I've discovered that a lot of the businesses do the bare minimum. Uh, and a lot of them don't carry neck loops, unfortunately. So it's something that you could complain about, I guess. And move on from there. All right. So um, why, why do we use hearing loops? Well, ease of use. Juliet, Juliet went over this, you know, no borrowing of equipment. You don't have to go up to the counter and say, I need something to hear with. You just turn your T-coil on and there you are. Uh, the hygiene part of it, um, a lot of people don't like to use headphones that other people have used. Um, and so with the hearing loop and the T-coil and your own hearing aid, you kind of bypass that. Um, we went through the signage, uh, the international sign. The heat, well, it's behind me. The, you can see kind of the ear without the whole thing. But down at the bottom is the T, and that's the important part. When you see that T, of course, um, that means there's a telecoil involved, which is of interest to all those who want to listen to the loop, okay? It's ADA compliant. Um, there's only three systems right at the present time that are ADA compliant, America's Disability Act compliant, uh, the hearing loop, the FM system and the IR system currently are the only three systems that are compliant and that are um, available to people to meet the, uh, the part of their compliance with the ADA Act. Um, let's see, moving on, let's go to where. Uh, again, Juliet kind of took care of a lot of that, but let's just say uh, the US Supreme Court has a hearing loop, Library of Congress, Broadway theaters have loops. New York taxi cabs now have some loops or some taxi cabs have loops. In England, almost every taxi cab you go in has a loop, which is really cool. I was there a few years ago. I got in the back seat and saw the T-coil sign, turned on my T-coil and had a conversation with the taxi driver. It's absolutely amazing because as you probably well know, there's a glass or plastic partition between the driver and the passenger, which makes it very difficult to communicate. And it was very easy with the loop. It's kind of neat. So uh, let's see. The, oh yeah, here's one. Uh, about 10 years ago, 
I got a call from BART, which is a transportation system up in San Francisco. Why they called me, I don't know, but they did. And I talked with their designers and they were wanting to know about the hearing loop and if it was feasible for their system. I put them in contact with the manufacturer that I'm comfortable with, which was Contacta. Uh, and it kind of exploded from there over the years. Uh, it was transferred to one of the dealers up in San Francisco and they did some test installations. And actually now BART has, and we're talking about Southern California or Northern California, San Francisco area, BART now has uh, hearing loops on their platforms and on their kiosks. Uh, it's actually, as well as the subway systems in New York, their kiosks have uh, hearing loops. So we've got uh, churches, Airport terminals, oh boy, is that a good one. Uh, concert halls, uh, theaters, city council chambers. I've done a lot of those uh, because the cities have to meet the requirement of the ADA as well. Um, uh, council chambers, meeting rooms, uh, community centers, uh, libraries. Who would think a library would need a hearing loop? I mean, it's supposed to be quiet, isn't it? Well, things have changed over the year. They have community rooms now where they do presentations and, and talks. And so I've done several libraries where uh, they've lo I've looped room and, and they provide <clears throat> information to uh, the community. Um, the taxis, the pharmacies and bank windows. Uh, if you, ever been to Los Angeles or one of these high profile cities, a lot of the banks have bandit barriers and they talk to you either through the little slot where they slip money or sometimes they have a speaker in the middle of the glass. They try to communicate with you through, which isn't very successful a lot of times. So because of that, uh, the, again, one of the dealers I, I contract with have developed a one-on-one -on -one system um, that is meant for areas like that where you are talking to the pharmacist or the teller behind the window and and want a little privacy so you have your telecoil in and they have a microphone and they communicate with you back and forth uh, and it's it's it makes life a lot easier Rick? Uh, yes you know, we have people that want to ask questions, and I want to be sure we have enough time. Okay. So let, let me, uh, you want yeah. me just to finish up? I can do that really quick. Well, yeah, why don't you do a quick finish up? Uh, and while you're thinking about that, I just want to say, uh, Rick has installed seven hearing loops here in Laguna Woods Village in our clubhouses. And of course, we've been uh, locked out of our clubhouses. But um, and also he's done uh, at the city hall at Laguna Woods, and that's just I'm just talking about local stuff. We have three churches that are looped here in Laguna Woods, and I uh, and, and Rick is responsible for that. We have you know more that uh that is being planned for, and um, so he Rick has just been a great asset to us here in Southern California, and he does a lot of loops down in San Diego, so. Okay, let me just let me just finish up because the important part that this whole loop business is about is advocacy. All right, uh, real quick, I, like I said, I've been in this, this 15 years. When I started out, I was a newbie, and so I thought, okay, this is like any other business. You just mail stuff out and you go talk to people, and and we can sell loops all day long. Well, that's not true because people don't know what a hearing loop is. And so you have to educate them, which is a whole nother story. So marketing is, is very, very difficult for a hearing loop. Uh, so how do we market? We market through you. We talk to people and people talk to other people. And that's how it happens. Um, really quickly, um, cold calls, rec modeling. There, there's two things that I want to mention. First of all, uh, 
there's some clubs out there, the Sutoma Club. They're dedicated to hearing, better hearing. And so they promote uh, activity through their club with the hearing loop and they support hearing loops and they donate hearing loops and, and things like that. So clubs like that are a big help. Um, David Myers, people like him, Dr. David Myers, who are dedicated to having a hearing loop. He started this whole uh, area in Michigan that has blown up, as you, as Julia told you, it's just expanded into hundreds and hundreds of loops. And that's what we're trying to do in Laguna Woods. Uh, Julia Sturkins, my goodness. I mean, who, what better advocate is, is alive than Julia? I mean, she goes all over the country promoting hearing loops. I mean, I, she's done it for me. Uh, I mean, I've done presentations in churches where she's come out and given a, a talk. And it's just, it's, it's, it's such a benefit, you can't believe it. Um, the, one other thing that was kind of curious, there's a guy called Bill Dials. He's an audiologist up in the Northern California area. Somehow he got to be a huge believer in hearing loops. And so he started providing hearing loops with every hearing aid that he sold. He installed more than 2,300 hearing loops in the home up there. I mean, that, that's, I, I can't imagine that many loops. That's just amazing. Uh, trying to do that down here, you know, I kind of, oh, that's a good idea. What I'll do is I'll go out and I'll get an audiologist all excited about this. So again, 15 years ago, I thought, all right, this is a good way to do it. Go to the audiologist, offer to loop their offices for free, and they will promote hearing loops. So that's what I started doing. I probably did about 20 of them until I realized they didn't really care about hearing loops. So what was the point? I never got one call from, from any of those loops I installed in those offices. And it was kind of disappointing. Anyway, we're not going there. Terry Barron, Barron, talk about advocates. She's a wonderful advocate. She, she has made Laguna Woods a center of hearing loops and, it, and the churches around it and the city hall. And, and it, it's, it's amazing, people like that. So it trickles down to you. You have to say, when you're in a venue, you have to tell them, I can't hear, I need something. Go, go to your church and say, I can't hear, we need something in this church. And I have an idea for you, how about a hearing loop? And they can move there. Um, I have discovered, I, I've done, I don't know, I guess I could say hundreds of churches because it, it has been a lot of churches that I've done over the years. And almost every one of them, was because somebody asked for a loop. One or two people asked for a loop and the church called me and said, what can we do? And that's how most churches are done. Some churches, um, in fact, a couple of local ones that I've done, one person donated the loop to the church. I mean, that's, that's amazing. That's how interested they were in hearing the sermon. So just to finish hey, up that. Rick? Yes. Rick, this is Juliet. I just posted um, a couple of links in the chat um, because you're talking about advocacy. And I have blogged extensively on this topic. Um, I know you have. So that if people want to read more, um, they can just click on my blog on WordPress and they can read a ton of information. Um, and, and it's my experience, Rick, that if you reach out to HLAA members who are familiar with loops and you ask for help, most of them will jump into gear. Right, you're Tony? Abso you're absolutely right, Juliet. Yeah. 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 You, know, I, you know, we really are very short on time. We got to get- That's to okay. I'm, I'm pretty much done. So you okay. carry on there, Tony. Good. So, uh, so if you have a question, please use the raise the hand. And uh, Vicki, you're first on board. I'm going to ask to uh, you to unmute. Uh, yes, this is Vicki in Colorado Springs. And my question is for either Juliet or Rick. When I am in an audio, uh, an automobile, and I turn on my telecoil, 
I hear a hum, so I really don't understand the speech so well. I don't know what that hum is, so I'm curious about all these taxi cabs and what other people do in them. Do they have that same hum, and what do you do about it? Hey, Vicki, um, almost always that noise is generated by the alternator. Um, and frequently it can be fixed, but it can be a problem in certain make cars. And I've had people actually switch from a Toyota Camry to another Toyota. The Camry didn't have it. They switched to a different model and it does. Um, and so in the cabs, that is taken care of. The manufacturers of these um, automobiles um, pay attention to that because it's being measured. But in private cars, it can be an issue. So if you're in the market for a car, I know people who have looped their cars, um, you need to make sure that you have a car that doesn't have this electromagnetic interference. Okay. Exactly. Uh, great question. It is a great question. It's not only cars that that happens in. If you walk into a venue, this is not the the popular or the, the uh, professional way to do it. But if you walk into a venue and you click on your hearing aid and you hear a buzz, okay, that's an electromagnetic feedback caused by maybe the dimmers or the lights or electrical in, uh, connection that is not grounded. Something has, is occurring that's causing this electromagnetic signal uh, to be interrupted. So that can be however, corrected as well. However, Rick, if a person with a hearing aid turns on their telecoil and there is no sound input, the hearing aid will have an automatic gain control and turn up the volume. So you may actually hear a little buzzing, but as soon as somebody starts to talk, that noise disappears. Um, so people, think they can use their hearing aid to measure EMI, but it's not the way to go. They need to get an expert like you in there with a measuring device. There you any, go. any other questions? Yeah, we got uh, Connie. <laughs> Unmute yourself. I want that penny. Unmute myself. Okay, I had to unmute. Oh, you know, first of all, I appreciate everything you guys are talking about. I am um, the chairman of the hearing loss group in the city of Orange out here, right near Tony. And I'm so glad she let us join this meeting. Um, there's, I just wanted to mention um, one thing before my question. There's a gentleman in um, the cochlear implant group that his name is Richard Parker. And he also is doing these, you know about them, okay, because definitely you want to hook up with him. And, um, but my question is this, I have a cochlear implant that I've had for two years, and I have my hearing aid in the other ear. They both have telecoil capability. Yeah. Of course, you try to do the rehab on your cochlear implant. And when I do that, I can just use the telecoil here and leave the hearing aid off. But when I turn my hearing aid telecoil on, it is way more powerful. No. Am I too loud? No, it's no. Way stronger. I, I am thrilled you're asking this question. May I ask you another question? Are you wearing a Phonak hearing aid? No. I, my hearing aid is a, an old Siemens. It's now, it's Sydney and okay. it, it has a towel coil, but I hesitate to get an, another hearing aid. Yeah. But I do I use a, a Quattro Pro Yeah. because I don't think Bluetooth is as powerful. Okay. The, pro, the reason your telecoil is so powerful is that your audiologist has programmed it for use on the telephone and he or she did not program it for use in a hearing loop. Two different animals. Almost everybody needs their telecoil boosted to use on the phone. But Rick sets the hearing loop to a certain standard. 
And if you go into a loop that Rick has installed and your hearing aid is set for telephone use, the T-coil will be boosted and will be therefore way too loud. I can help you or I can help your audiologist program the telecoil better. This is a programming issue. It is not a telecoil issue. Can I can you help program you. program it for both? Yes, you can. Now, now, having said that, depending on how old your hearing aid is, but almost all hearing aids allow for more than one T-coil program. So you can have a T-coil for use on the phone, mm -hmm. nice and loud, and you can have a T-coil setting for in a hearing loop. But my experience is that most people don't want the T-coil super loud, not even on the phone. They just want the telecoil program so they can hear in assistive systems with good clarity. So you and I should communicate. And I happen to know somebody high up in the Signia company. Okay. I can help you. And another part of the question, who manufactures the telecoils that go in the hearing aids and the cochlear implants. Is it one manufacturer? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Time. That's a good question. The Siemens, no, the Widex company, W-I-D-E-X, the Widex company is, as far as I know, the only company that manufactures their own telecoils. And it's my experience that telecoils and Widex hearing aids are among the best. The unfortunate thing is that Widex doesn't sell their T-coils to other hearing aid companies. They buy their telecoils, I'm pretty certain, from the Genom Corporation, but I could be wrong there. Um, what's far more important is that the manufacturers pay attention how the telecoil is programmed in the hearing aid. So when you switch from mic to telecoil, the gain setting in the hearing aid should match that from the microphone setting and from the T-coil and the microphone should match. I have been extremely vocal about this. Um, audiologists and manufacturers know that that is a pet peeve of mine. And I have to tell you, I'm seeing changes. So my guess is when you buy a new hearing aid, that issue will be better. That shouldn't sure. be an issue anymore. And here's one more thing. When you buy a new hearing aid, you'll get an app on your phone that allows you to change the mix from microphone to telecoil and everything in between. Um, and so you need to explore that and you need to tell your audiologist that you want to try the T-coil before you'll commit to a particular brand. Oh, sure. So the so the T-coil and the hearing aid has to be set for either a phone or a loop. It can't be the same. Yes, but then it needs to be for the loop, not for the phone. Okay. Because the phone will be way too loud. Interesting. The phone one is loud. Okay, so that's... Generally. Loud. And at that time I was working and that was most important to me was the phone. I get it. What about the cochlear implants? Who manufactures their T-coil? I don't know. They okay. Any cochlear implants? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. And Rick, I'll be talking to you about doing Kaiser if I can get them <laughs> <laughs> their good. community room. I hear you. Okay. So Thank you. Einham Post um, hearing aid dispenser, you're up next. You want to unmute yourself? Yeah, I just want to thank Rick. He he looped our our uh, front lobby, and it's been indispensable to be able to show people how to get in and out of the 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 T coil mode. Um, so they they see that right there. They can do it for themselves. It's very easy to train someone when I have that, and it's been indispensable showing people how to how to use their their T coils. That's just that's great. That's great. It can. I have a suge two suggestions for you. Mm -hmm. Be sure to post your hearing loop on the hearing tracker website. 
Okay. If you haven't done that, that's Abe Bailey, Abram Bailey's website, and you can list your practice as having one that offers a hearing loop, um, kind of sets you apart from other uh, dispensers and audiologists. And secondly, you can now list your office as being looped on Google Earth. Okay. So the Get in the Hearing Loop Committee has been working with Google and Google accessibility. And there's one person here who can talk a lot more about that than I can, okay. Okay. and that's Wynn. Um, but you'll be able to post on your Google, um, um, I, I, I don't know the exact word, Wynn, help me out here. Uh, but it's a it's a way to get again a little bit more PR for the fact that you've gone this extra step. It's a very cool thing, and you'll be one of the first audiologists or dispensers who has done that. So please do it. Yes. Absolutely. So so this is when I'll jump in. We're about to do a big release, so this is a little preview. Um, we don't have the capabilities of it yet, so you can't jump on and do it. We're hoping to do a big splash and a big preview with some of that. So I'll just, I'll leave okay. it at that. Okay, sorry, I jumped That's the fine. gun. Can I ask you, was it Google Maps or Google Earth? It's Google Maps. Maps, okay, okay. But right. wouldn't it mean, yeah. when that your location, when it pops up on Google Maps, list that it has this type of technology available? Yeah, so it's ideally what we would like to have happen is that when you have a new app on your phone, the app has not been developed yet, but there could be apps in the making that as you walk into a facility, your app, if you have it set up that way, will go ding, there's a hearing loop here. Do you want to use it? So when they walk into Ken's office, that a feature will will trigger an alert on your phone. I know it sounds all very techy, um, but just we think people who use hearing loops and like hearing loops think it's just awesome that Google is paying attention. And it's paying attention because Wynn has been working with them. Thank you. Thank you Welcome, Wynn and others. Yes. Yes. So you know, Wynn is part of the Hearing Loss Association of America. She's part of the Get in the Hearing Loop Committee, and um, she's a volunteer. So I just, I, I just want to emphasize that it's, it's really volunteers that are really on the ground, doing, you know, uh, doing the work. And Wynn has just been phenomenal. I attend the uh, committee meetings. Um, I wish I could participate more. But um, I learn a lot, and it's very appreciative. Now, I know Sherry. Sherry, did you have anything that you would like to add? She's on the committee, too. Hello, everyone. It's great to see you all. And Juliet, thanks uh, so much for your presentation. And Richard, it's nice to uh, meet you virtually. Um, I just wanted to say we do have a very, very engaged and active Get in the Hearing Loop Committee. And um, there's so much that we're trying to do to try to get the word out to help all of our boots on the ground advocates and our hearing loop installers and to also be able to reach out and to serve the hard of hearing community as a whole. So it really does take a village coming together to work collaboratively. Everyone has a great idea, but in order to put all of these great ideas to work, it takes a project manager and a team to actually pull it all together to make these great things happen. And so I just would like to thank Wynn for being able to jump in to, to comment on the, the Google project that is a project that they've been working on uh, for some time. Uh, we haven't got it all together, but it's great news. It's something that's going to be coming forward that we hope will really help put uh, hearing loops on the map so to speak. So uh, so anyway, so thank you very much for everyone for being here. If anyone has a question uh, for us, I will put um, 
uh, an, an email address in the chat for you. You can always email uh, the whole committee at our info at getting the hearing loop um, at hearingloss.org uh, address, and, and that will go to the Get in the Hearing Loop committee. It might take a day or two to get a, a response, but someone will respond to you um, on the behalf of the Get in the Hearing Loop committee. So, so thanks again so much for your advocacy. And remember, yeah, always have to get out there and make that ask because if no one says that they're having trouble hearing or what kind of hearing help do you have available, there's probably not gonna be any hearing access for you. So advocacy and access go hand in hand. Thanks. Exactly. So Cherry, would you please put uh, contact information for the Get in the Hearing Loop for consumers? and um and any any information that you feel we would need i do know that we all need to be active in reporting where we have loops so that they get in on google google just doesn't know this by osmosis we have to create lists so the um the committee get in the hearing loop committee is collecting this information and uh providing it to google it's a big project putting it all together. So, but it's very important that yeah. everyone um, who has, uh, knows where there's a hearing loop, that that information gets to the, the committee so that it gets to Google. And I just wanna remind everybody, um, because I know uh, Sherry's gonna put some things in the chat room. Uh, Alan, would you again uh, explain how people can save the chat to their own computer so that they have all these links and information. Okay. On a computer, a laptop or a desktop, if you have your chat, chat window open in the lower right hand screen, there's a little faint rectangle with three dots in it. If you click on the three dots, it opens up a menu right at the top it says save chat. When you save the chat, it will save it. And in Windows, it will save it to the document folder and in the subfolder called Zoom. And I don't know where it goes in a Mac or Apple device. Yeah. Well, I learned something every time. And now I learned how to save chats. So this is wonderful. And for those of you who've never heard in the loop, if all of us who are experienced with hearing loops sound a little zealous, we are. <laughs> because we are, right? It's so powerful to allow people to hear so much better with the hearing aids and their cochlear implants that they already own. I tell you, you foster one hearing loop you think you have hit the jackpot and then you foster another one it's like oh my god and the third one you are officially addicted so um, please don't think that this is not for you you go places where you have trouble hearing if you don't speak up nothing's gonna change absolutely wow can't thank you enough juliet you are wonderful and Rick, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure you're, you're gonna be uh, hearing from people in Southern California. Uh, if, they, if there's a place where you would like to have a hearing loop, um, you know, let's, let's talk about it and let's get Rick on the job at least to go out and uh, with his little meter and make sure that <laughs> how that, the best way to put in a, a hearing loop in that location. There you go. So, and I've included his name, his uh, email address, and his telephone number in the chat. And uh, Juliet is in there, and the Get in the Loop Committee is in there. And um, can't thank you all enough for being here and moving forward. <laughs> thank <laughs> you, Tony. Hearing. That's great. Thanks, Tony, for organizing this event. Great job. And. and and this is recorded, and so I, I will be posting it on um, 
on YouTube in the chapters YouTube. And if you just give me a second, I'll, I will actually um, give you the link to where to look for it. Uh, let's see, I keep it in keep. And Everybody better look and smile. You're going to be on camera. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this right. audience has been great. You know, sometimes, um, you know, what, what, what has happened is when we first started doing Zoom meetings, when everybody was in lockdown, uh, people had to learn how to Zoom. Now we're, you know, a, a, a month, uh, 14 months down the road, and everybody's learned how to Zoom. And um, yeah, so it's, uh, okay, where is YouTube? All right. Well, I can't find the general general I've got for individuals. Oh. Alan just posted it in the chat. He did. For the, I think so. For, oh. Well, Alan, aren't you just great? I Alan is a volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> it's so important. Um, is that okay? I assume that's for Mission Viejo, Alan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and so today is, uh, for those Tuesday. of you, so, for those of you who want to see more videos, there are quite a few videos of my recordings. Um, and if you email me, I'm happy to share them with you. Excellent. Okay, be very worthwhile. Thank you all very Bye. much. Have a great week. Thanks for Thanks. inviting me. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Juliet. All right. Bye -bye. Thanks, Tony.